Voice of the Sea, learning from experts across the ocean. Welcome to Voice of the Sea. In this episode, we're learning about the strange fish of the deep with scientists Jeff Drazen and Kristen Glockler. Their research shows that deep water fishes and the food they eat are dependent on tiny suspended particles. We start off with Jeff Drazen at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, where we get to take a closer look at some of these deep sea creatures. What we've got here is the players in this food web that we are trying to understand and using isotopes to do that. What I thought I'd do is I'd start with the surface waters and I'd show you some of the animals and I'm going to focus on fishes today and I'm going to show you the ones that eat zooplankton for starters. This is a fish that lots of people know about. These are flying fish and they're really common here in Hawaii and they've got those fantastic wings mm -hmm. and they have very small mouths and they mostly eat little zooplankton. Then as you get deeper into the water column, then you start finding animals like lantern fishes. And these guys right here, they oftentimes have lights between their eyes and those little spots on their sides, those are all the photophores, the light organs. And these animals, they migrate daily. So during the day, they're hiding from predators, things like tunas. And they dive down into the dark, and that's where they stay. And it's thought that they come up every night to feed on the zooplankton in surface waters, perhaps some of the same zooplankton as the flying fish. And when we look at their isotopes, that's indeed what we find, is that um, generally speaking, they are feeding on a food web that, at least at its base, is fueled from the same same material. And then we get a little, a little bit deeper and sometimes not deeper but just um, fishes that live deep and they don't migrate up to the surface. And this little tiny fish right here is called a bristle mouth. And this is what we're finding to be quite an interesting species. It also has little lights and it's not unlike the, the other two in that it eats, we think it eats zooplankton. But these little guys, they have a really unique isotope signature, makes us suspect that they are eating food that comes from the suspended particle food web, this unusual source of nutrition that we think helps the, the deep water food web go on. Does that mean that there might be zooplankton that is surviving on those suspended particles? Right. we got to step back one. These, these are still predators. They're, of course, they're not eating the particles themselves. They can't possibly strain out such small things. But they're probably eating very small zooplankton, little copepods or maybe salps or things like that, that can eat these particles. So they're the next step up. And we can see this isotopically. These guys look way different than the other two, the flying fish and the lantern fish that I just showed you. What we also wanted to look at were some of the predators to see whether or not these kinds of signals go up another level in the food web. And in surface waters, we have things like mahi-mahi. Uh -huh. They show a uh, isotope signature that looks like flying fish, which happen to be their favorite food. <laughs> and we know this from, you know, any fisherman knows this, um, just looking at what's in the stomachs of a mahi-mahi. When you get a little deeper, then the results are kind of interesting and still developing. So we have animals like this dragonfish right here. These are great, wonderful creatures. They are deep water predators, and they have lights, these little dots, all along their bellies. Mm -hmm. And they have little lures, and they blink these on and off, and they try to fool something to come in close in front of their mouth where they can open up this, this great mouth with all these fang-like teeth and, and eat them. And we've looked at a couple different kinds of these dragonfishes, and they actually don't have an isotopic signature that suggests they eat the bristle mouths. They're mostly eating these guys. Oh. And their food web is largely derived from organic material that's sinking particles from or this. from the surface. So they're very closely linked to production in the surface. We found the similar thing for this fang tooth right here, which is a wonderful beastly looking creature. And we, we need to look at some others. 
The dragonfish can migrate a bit, and so it's not a great surprise what we found with the isotopes. Uh -huh. The fang tooth doesn't, but it still looks like it's eating material that derives from the surface, mm -hmm. which is um, a little different. We have some others that we need to take a look at that might eat more of the bristle mouths, and those include some of the angler fishes. And they don't migrate at all. Many of them are found very, very deep, and this is an angler fish right here. And these guys are, they're little floating heads. <laughs> they have a little lure on their, on their forehead. They blink them on and off. And they're, they're just all head. They have a massively expansible stomach, and they can eat something that's at least equivalent to their own body size mm -hmm. all at once. So we haven't looked at these, and there's a number of other fishes we still need to look at to try to tease apart how the structure of the food web is coming together. So at this point, you're not sure what else out there is eating these bristle mouths? No, we've got to find, there's got to be something out there. So the bristle mouth, it's a genus, and there's about eight species, well, about 12 worldwide. They are present from about maybe 1,500 feet down to many thousands of feet all throughout the world's oceans. And they're never super abundant in any one place, but they live across such a vast area of the world that when you sum up their abundance, they're the most abundant vertebrate on the planet. There are more bristle mouths than any other species of fish, than any other species of bird or mammal or any other vertebrate. They are the most common thing. They've got to have an importance in the food web. Somebody's got to be eating them. We just have to continue with our analyses and try to tease out who that is. So they're the most common in terms of number or the most common in terms of biomass? They are incredibly abundant in terms of biomass. They vie for biomass with these lantern fishes. They are some of the biomass dominance in the world for fishes. They are typically small, but they are the most common in terms of number. Is it possible that like other deep diving like marine mammals or something might be eating them? It's possible. They have typically pretty broad diets that include a lot of surface material as well. Things like beak whales, which are deep divers that we know very little about, um, we're not sure. It seems they eat more squid than they uh -huh. do fish. But there are other deep diving predators like opa and lancet fish, which we don't eat, but it's very common in our longline fishery which do eat these things. And we've also got swordfish and a couple of other animals that are commercially important. And so how will you look at those fish to determine if they are in fact eating these bristle mouths? Well, we can look at the stomach contents and oh. just open them up and see if they have <laughs> bristle mouths in their guts. And we've done that for a few. And so opa and lancet fish, for instance, they do eat them. And in fact, big eye tuna will eat these bristle mouths occasionally as well. The other thing is we can look at the isotope signatures of the predators and we can continue to follow it up the food web. Can you explain to me what these isotope signatures are? We know that there is material from surface waters that sinks into the deep sea. And we can look at the nitrogen in that material. Nitrogen, of course, is one of the common molecules in all living matter. Mm -hmm. And it has a particular isotope signature. So these are the relative amounts of heavy and light atoms of nitrogen, either uh, an atomic weight of 14 or an atomic weight of 15. Basically, 15 nitrogen has got an extra um, neutron in it, so it's a little bit heavier. And so when the phytoplankton are fixing carbon and creating biomass at the very bottom of the food web, they impart a certain nitrogen signature to this material. And we can trace that. So we found that most of the nitrogen is in proteins, in amino acids. And there are some amino acids which typically, when they pass from prey into the predator, they don't change a whole lot. And the amino acid signature stays the same. That material is incorporated directly. And then there's other amino acids, and they're broken down to a large extent and resynthesized, and so they show a big shift in their nitrogen isotope signature. And using these different amino acids and the way their isotope signatures change, we can trace both the source of food as it moves through the food web, and we can trace changes in trophic level. A trophic level is how many different predators and prey have cycled through that same piece of nitrogen. That's right. Trophic level one are your primary producers. Trophic level two would be your zooplankton, 
which are grazing on all of these microscopic algae. Mm -hmm. And then trophic level three would be these fishes that I've pulled out here, your flying fish or your lantern fishes. And then trophic level four would be your predators, like your dragonfish, uh -huh. or your anglerfish, or a mahi-mahi or tuna, something like that. There's trophic level five, there's a few things. Those would be marlins, big sharks, and, and the like. People. And of course, there's people <laughs> at the very top. The University of Hawaii Sea Grant College program, focused on Hawaii's coasts and its communities, through sustainable development, safe seafood supply, sustainable coastal tourism, hazard resilience, and healthy coastal ecosystems. Hawaii Sea Grant. We're in the Marine Biology Building at UH with graduate student Kristen Glockler, looking under the microscope at bristlemouths, the most abundant fishes in the sea, and learning how these fish fit into the ocean food web. So Kinesa, this is a graduate student working in our lab. Kristen. Hi, and Kristen. Kristen Hi, Kristen. Nice to meet you too. Focusing on these little fish. These are the bristle mouse that we were just talking about. Right. So this species that we have here, it's called Cyclothony pallida, and it's the largest of the bristle mouse that we find around Hawaii. They're usually found from about 1,500 meters to 500 meters. Some people have tried to do gut content analysis on these fish to try to figure out what they're eating uh -huh. and cut open their stomachs, but usually what they find is that the stomachs are either empty or have maybe one zooplankton in it, or most of the time it's just full of mush. So it's actually really hard to tell what these guys are eating just based on looking what's in their stomachs, which is why we use the stable isotopes to try to uh, look at what they're eating. How come you don't use genetics to look at what they're eating? Well, so since these guys are on the third trophic level, when you get into higher trophic level, level fish, if you're doing genetics on what's in their stomach, you're not only getting the genetics of what they're eating, you're also getting anything that's in the stomach of what they ate. So if the, if the bristlemouth ate a copepod and the copepod ate some algae, then you've got the genetics of all of that in there and you're not really getting good rep representation of what it's eating. If I look at it under the microscope, what am I looking for? Like uh, so some of the cool things about these fish, they have really, really reduced eyes, which is because they live in the dark, and it's really not important for them to be able to see. Uh -huh. They've also got lines of little black dots around their stomachs. I don't know if you can see this. Yep. So those are the photophores, and those are uh, light organs that can match the light that is coming through from the surface. Anything that is underneath the cyclothony, looking up at it, won't be able to see it because the light organs are matching the level of lights that are coming down from the surface. That's one of the ways that it stays camouflaged. Another way is that it's really, it's a really translucent fish. And this one that's kind of burst open, are those eggs in there? Um, probably not. It's probably just its stomach. <laughs> oh, can you take a look and sure. just tell me what that Maybe. is? Maybe. It might be, oh, maybe it is eggs. We could ask, that does look like eggs, actually. Hey, Jeff. Yeah. Eggs? <laughs> could be. Kind of does look like it. Yep, those are the eggs. Eggs, okay. So this is a gravid female. It's definitely one of the smallest fish out there. So this animal is, uh, this is full adult size. And there's other uh, species, a couple of species in this genus that only reach about half of this size. So there can be some really, really oh. small ones. So these are the bristle mouths, and uh, they have a really large jaw. So their head only comes back to about right here, but their jaw comes back all the way to here. They have a tiny little eye, and which is just right there. And then along their belly, you move this. If you look, they've got a, a fins right here and here. And then right along their belly, these little tiny black dots that are really hard to see, those are all the lights uh, that can light up. They use them for communication and, and also uh, preventing a shadow from being generated underneath their body. So their stomach is this black mass right here and, and their guts. 
and uh, they have really tiny little fins and in many ways uh, look like a, uh, a very unusual fish. That is the gigantic mouth of the, of the bristle mouth. Wow, they have tiny eyes, huh? Yeah. When they come up in trawls, um, they can be in good shape like this, but sometimes they're very, very difficult to see, and they're also very difficult to see in predators' stomachs because they're small, and their skin comes off very easily, and they have very weak fins, and sometimes people just look at them and think that they're worms, <laughs> that they, they, really? they're not even fish. Their eyes are so tiny, but you know, if you look at them under the scope, you can see all the, those features. And these, this is a big species of cyclotony. They've also got this massive mouth that opens up like this. And let me, I'll just pick this guy up. But this mouth, the jaw, opens up like that. Uh -huh. So it's the entire head length oh, is wow. the jaw. Inside, they get the name bristle mouth because at the back of the mouth, there are all these little bristles so that food can't just pass through. They can trap the little, the little zooplankton that they eat. Kind of a simple little, little animal that's proving to be quite an interesting one. When you started this work, was this fish one of the ones that you envisioned you'd end up being so important? Not initially, no. When we, when we started some of this work and started looking at these amino acid isotopes, we looked at a, a whole diversity of, of fishes, and I kind of expected some of the lanternfish to be the ones that might show a, a tie-in. And so it was, a, it was a bit of a surprise. In hindsight, it kind of made a bit of sense because, as Kristen was saying, when we tried to do stomach content analyses, when scientists have looked at what the, these animals eat, those studies aren't terribly conclusive because their stomachs are often empty or there's mush in them or, you know, there's not much there. So, you know, I guess it kind of figures that this would be the kind of species where you'd, you'd get a surprise. And so we could take a look at some predators? Yeah. Show them a yeah. tub of fun. The Curriculum Research and Development Group in the College of Education at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. CRDG's training routes go back over 40 years. Through professional development programs, curriculum workshops, research on teaching methodology, individualized school and district training, and so much more. The Curriculum Research and Development Group, improving schools, improving education. CRDG. Welcome back. We're talking with School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology researcher, Jeff Drazen, about ocean food webs. We move up the food chain to some of the ocean's top level predators, like sharks, tuna, swordfish, and montong. Here we have some of those larger predators that we were talking about that go up to trophic level four. So they're beyond the small, small fishes or small squids and things like that. So we have all kinds of creatures, some of which a lot of people know because they eat them, and some of which are, are a little more rare. This is a surface-dwelling shark. This is an oceanic white-tip shark. So this is an animal that would eat larger fishes in the surface waters. And we've got things like aku, skipjack tuna, which actually do eat some of the lantern fishes, but focus to probably a slightly greater extent on more surface dwelling kinds of prey. When you get into the deeper waters, this is a very small swordfish right here. You can see the nice sword. These guys are eating a lot more of the deeper water prey. But again, so far, it seems that at least isotopically, they look like they're, they're taking advantage of a food web that's more the sinking particles or the vertical migrating species that are coming up to the surface and feeding. Where the cyclothony are going is still a bit of a mystery. And then there's some other deep living fish, fishes. This is a monchong. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've ever eaten these, these are outstanding. Um, yeah, and so this is a deeper living species for which we actually don't really know much about uh, what it eats. This guy's another one we don't know much about what it eats. This is a walu. 
or an Escalar. The eyes have been sampled for other scientific process. These animals, we actually tried to do a stomach content study on them, and their stomachs kept turning up empty, or it may be that they just regurgitate when they get caught. We still don't have a really good idea of what these eat. They look very much like a tuna in some respects, but they're clearly much darker and deeper living, and they could be foraging on, on cyclothony, on a bristle mouse. And so to figure out which of these, the ones that you don't know what they're feeding on, that might be feeding on the bristle mouse, that's where the isotope work is going to come. That's where the isotope work becomes very important. Doing stomach content analysis on these kinds of fishes, which we do, is very labor intensive. So you open up that stomach and out come two things, a hundred things, and they're in various states of digestion and you have to identify these digested bits. Uh -huh. and, and so that gets very, very time consuming. With the isotopes, if there's going to be a significant input from this suspended particle pool, you know, moving up the food web, you should see that by analyzing a handful of these fish's tissues. That is in and of itself time consuming, but probably far less time consuming than look at the, looking at the guts of a hundred fish. Right. And you don't need as many samples. You don't need as many samples. Now, can you use these preserved samples or do you need to go out and collect fresh tissue? We try to collect fresh tissue, but we have found that you can actually use stuff that's been preserved in formaldehyde. This is all in alcohol now, but you can use preserved tissue. So it's a really powerful technique and actually might help us sort of look at food web structure historically because there are all these museums around the country and they've all got these fish that have been collected from you know the 1800s up through all the 1900s until now and they might enable us to see whether or not there were big shifts in in the structure of food webs over time. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is a dynamic curriculum developed by the University of Hawaii's Curriculum Research and Development Group, teaching ocean science concepts through the disciplines of physics, chemistry, biology, and ecology. Exploring Our Fluid Earth is now available freely online. Find out more at exploringourfluidearth.org.